Yeah. By the way, I'm too. I'm going to be gone out of t- going out of town and uh, on during Hanukkah. I may actually get to see my grandchildren for the first time since before this uh, pandemic began. Its whole thing. I had to miss one bar mitzvah. Well, so it goes. Okay, we will begin as normal with the uh, weekly Torah portion. We're getting into the middle of the book of Genesis, Sefer Breshit. And uh, we are going to have several, uh, two very major episodes that are going to take place in this week's Torah portion. It begins, Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanav El Esav Achiv Arta Seir. Jacob sends Malachim. Now the word Malach here is the same word that we also use for a, an angel. But we also see from its usage here that it really has the meaning of messenger. Right? So an angel is really a messenger. So the straightforward reading of this uh, uh, opening of the, of the story is that he sent messengers. Uh, although the Midrash says he actually sent out angels. And the Midrash always likes to build things up. The rabbis had fun with that. And he sends them uh, to... Uh, his brother Esau, and to where he's living in the land of Seir, the country of Adam. And he says, thus shall you say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I stayed with Levan and remained until now. I have acquired cattle, asses, sheep, and male and female slaves. And I send this message to my Lord in the hope of gaining your favor. So Jacob is seeking to appease his brother as it continues, it says how he sends gifts uh, to Esau. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, at least at first, the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau. He himself is coming to meet you and there are 400 men with him. Now, it doesn't sound like it's a, a big greeting party or it's a greeting party of a uh, different sort. So Jacob gets very worried. Uh, and concerned that uh, he might be attacked by his brother Esau. So he divides his camp into two parts with a very simple idea that if one uh, part is attacked, the other can escape. And then he prays to God, uh, asking God to uh, protect him. And then they cross over the river uh, and... uh, He has to go back across the Yabuk River to pick up some things that got left behind. And there he meets a man. It says, again, the the Torah says, uh, Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. Okay. So he's identified as Ish. We know from the story, it's a Malach, it's an angel of God. Once again, it, it's clear from the language used in the Torah here that one does not necessarily recognize that one is in the presence of an angelic being. Uh, they look, he looks like a man and they wrestle. And so neither one can, can whip, beat the other. There's no three minute, three second. <gasps> pinning of the shoulders uh, until finally the uh, stranger, this man says, uh, this translated, wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket. Uh, he somehow injured Jacob uh, on the hip and the uh, injury it was understood to be at the sciatic nerve. Uh, and that is, uh, as it says in a moment, that's why the children of Jacob uh, don't eat uh, that part of the animal. Thy thigh muscle that is on the socket of the hip, thy sciatic nerve. When we talk about kashrut, we'll go into that whole thing and uh, why that means uh, you can't go get a T-bone steak in a kosher restaurant if you have uh, can afford it, all right? So uh, uh, as at the end of this wrestling match though, uh, 
Jacob's, uh, the guy says to Jacob, let me go for dawn is breaking. But he answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, what is your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with beings divine and human and have prevailed. So now the name change is significant. Names are significant in the Bible. Jewish tradition has always regarded names as being significant. If you remember, he gets his name Yaakov, Jacob, from the uh, fact that he was holding on to the, not the elbow, but to the heel of his brother. And Akef means heel. It means to come also to become in place of somebody else, to uproot them, usurp them. So he says, you no longer be known as Jacob, the usurper, but Yisrael, one who struggled with the human and the divine and have prevailed. It's not quite clear how Yisrael, Israel means that exactly. Uh, that, but that is the understanding of it uh, of, uh, traditionally, although some suggest the actual meaning is God is superior. Yashar El. Yisrael, Yashar El. But be that as it may, we're going to see from now on, there's an interchangeability uh, between the names of Jacob and the name of Israel. And eventually we call B'nai Yisrael, B'nai Yaakov, the sons of Jacob are called B'nai Yaakov, B'nai Yisrael, the sons of Israel. Hence the whole concept of the children of Israel in Egypt, etc. cetera. Okay. So after this event take, has taken place, uh, Jacob looks up and he sees that his brother Esau indeed is coming to meet him with 400 uh, men. And so he they divides up the children between Leah, Rachel, and the two maids, putting the maids and their children first, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. And uh, famously, Rashi comments on here, Achron, Achron, Chavid, the last one is the most beloved. So he starts with the least uh, of his children that he loves. To, it gets to Joseph, whom he loves the most, the, the concubines versus Leah, then versus uh, Rachel. So what does the Torah say happens? No, no big battle. All right, he says, he himself, meaning Jacob, went ahead and bowed low to the ground seven times until he was near his brother. Esau ran to greet him. He embraced him and falling on his neck, he kissed him and they wept. Looking about, all right, so we have this beautiful image. The two brothers, instead of fighting, they embrace each other. They kiss each other. The, the image that we seem to be given here is the brothers are making up. They're not at loggerheads any longer. Now, the rabbis were of different minds on this. Uh, and interestingly enough, in the Torah scroll itself, in the Torah, there are certain uh, places, words, letters, that will have dots on top of them, on top of the letters. So the word that he kissed him, Baishakehu, has a dot over each letter of that word. Now we know that the Greeks employed a methodology like this when they had a question about uh, a word in Homer. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, there's a wonderful essay by, by Professor Lieberman of blessed memory, uh, comparing some of these kinds of Greek not notation and what we find in a couple of places in the Torah. So, but it's clear that it means to call attention to that word, Vayishakehu. So the rabbis were of two camps. What else is new? You know, they divided up uh, one side against the other. Some said, Vayishakehu is to tell us, don't make a mistake. Don't think that Esau was, was not sincere 
when he kissed his brother Jacob. Indeed, it emphasized the word by Yishakei, he kissed him because indeed he was uh, a changed man, or at least at this point in time, and he sincerely kissed his brother and made up with him. So you can figure out what the other side is going to say. The other side says, it's dotted over the word Vishakeh who kissed him. So you shouldn't make the mistake and think that this is not the old Esau that you knew. This is Esau. This is Esau. He does, he's not sincere in the whole thing. Okay. So why does he cry? You know, it's very emotional. And he says, he embraced him and falling on his neck, he kissed him and they wept. He cried. So why is Esau crying? Well, so the Midrash, again, elaborating, because since Zari decided Esau's no good, said when he embraced him, when he fell on his neck, he wasn't meaning to kiss him, even though it says he kissed him. What it really means is he was going to bite him in the neck. Right? You know, you go down to the neck, kiss or ah. Okay, so he was going to bite him in the neck. But God at that moment turned Jacob's neck into uh, a marble. And so when Esau bit down on Jacob's neck, he broke his teeth and he cried from the broken teeth. All right. So take it or leave it, whichever way you want to interpret it. Uh, but they do, there is a, a, a certain um, tension that's not really released here. Uh, Jacob, uh, Esau looks up, he sees what Jacob has there, and he asks him about everybody, his family and his wealth, and he says, why did you send me all this stuff? And uh, he said, uh, uh, to, gain, uh, to gain my Lord's favor. Esau said, I have enough, my brother, let what you have remain yours. But Jacob said, no, I pray you, if you do me this favor, accept from me this gift, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Please accept my present. So in the normative uh, style of the Middle East, even till today, uh, Esau makes motion like he's refusing the gift. And Jacob says, no, no, you have to take it. Take it. And Esau says, well, if you insist, I'll take it. All right? And, sure, and so um, then... Esau said, uh, uh, let us uh, start on our journey and I will proceed at your pace. So Esau says, all right, you know, you're, you're going home. Uh, let me accompany you on your trip. And Jacob is not so sure about that. Uh, and he said to him, but uh, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me. If they were driven hard a single day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I travel slowly at the pace of the cattle before me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. All right, then, then Esau offers some men to him. No, oh, Jacob says, no, why do you, you don't, you're too kind. So Esau started back on that day on his way to Seir, but Jacob journeyed on to Sukkot and built a house for himself and made stalls for his cattle. And that is why the place is called Sukkot. Okay, so the brothers split up and they go their separate ways. And indeed, uh, again, the Midrash says someday uh, Jacob will visit uh, Esau in Seir and the final uh, reconciliation will take place. So then we've been introduced to a tragedy. Jacob settles for a while near the city of Shechem. And uh, he has one daughter, Dina. And Dina goes, you know, like any youngster, they want to see what's on in the town, this, this big town that she hasn't seen the town before in her life or whatever. And so uh, she goes into to town, look it over. And it says, Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, chief of the country, saw her and took her and lay with her by force. So uh, uh, Shechem, which is the name of the son, also the name of the city, rapes Dina. Uh, and after the rape though, he falls in love with her. 
he says, I tells his father, uh, Ham, uh, Hamor, get me this girl as a wife. And so then Jacob heard that his daughter had been defiled, uh, but his sons weren't with him at the time. They were out with the cattle. You know, he's uh, a minute ago, Jacob's got all kinds of people and everything with him. In this story, it seems like he's just dependent upon his sons. So in any case, uh, uh, Jacob kept silent till they come home. And then Shem's father, Hamor, came out to Jacob to speak to him. And meanwhile, Jacob's sons, having heard the news, came in from the field. The men were distressed and very angry because they committed an outrage in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing not to be done. So, all right, so Hamor wants to make a deal with Jacob. says, tell you what, let's, let's uh, unify. We'll form one people. We will be together. Uh, we will marry each other. Children will marry, our sons will marry your daughters, your sons will marry our daughters, and we'll have a nice little uh, time here, and it'll start with the wedding of Dina and Shem. Uh, and, uh, you know, he says, and you can get whatever bride price that you want. Uh, so, uh, Jacob's sons answered Shem, and not, not Jacob, his sons answered, speaking with guile because he had defiled their sister Dina. Now, there's a, they're not being honest brokers here. They don't want anything to do with Shem and Hamor in the city. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous moment, dangerous situation. Dina is still in their hands. They didn't bring her back to the family. So... Uh, they say, you know, it's a nice idea, but we have this little custom. Namely, men have to be circumcised. If they're not circumcised, uh, they can't marry our daughters. Uh, only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become like us, that every male among you is circumcised. All right, so say, All right we'll make a deal. As long as everybody gets circumcised, then we can follow up on everything. Well, you know, uh, it's not such an easy thing for an adult man to get circumcised, especially in those days with uh, uh, rusty knives and, and no anesthesia. But uh, by the way, in those days, they actually used flint knives. We know that the, uh, for Brit Mila, for circumcision, up until um, a much later period, uh, they maintained the custom of using a flint knife, which is actually very sharp and much easier to, uh, in, in many ways. But in any case, we'll talk about that more when we talk about Brit Mila, about circumcision. Okay. And lo and behold, Hamor uh, and, and Shem and, and Hamor uh, said, okay, we'll do it. Sure enough, all the men get circumcised. And according to tradition, three days after surgery is the worst day. So what happens three days after the surgery? On the third day, when they were in pain, Shimon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, brothers to Dina, right? Shimon and Levi are sons number two and three in the birth order, and they are sons of Leah, and therefore Leah was their full sister, both from father and mother. So they obviously have uh, more uh, concern about what has happened. Uh, so it says, each took his sword, came upon the city unmolested, and slew all the males. After all, they're, they're in bed, not feeling so great. So uh, Shimon and Levi come in and they kill all the men. There's a great deal of, of literature discussing this entire episode, discussing what, what right did Shimon and Levi have to carry out this kind of vigilante justice. Uh, you can look in, in various sources that, that just deal with it and trying to understand it. Uh, but anyway, they kill the men, they take uh, Dina out and went away. So then the other children, sons of Jacob comes upon what's been happened, and they plundered the town because their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and asses, all that was inside the town and outside, all the wealth, all their children and their wives, all that was in the houses they took as captives and booty. So what is Jacob's reaction to all of this? And Jacob said to Shimon Levi, 
you have brought trouble on me, making me odious among the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, and uh, the land, the Canaanites and Perizzites. My men are few in number, so that if they unite against me and attack me, I and my house will be destroyed. But they answered, should our sister be treated like a whore? Okay, so Jacob is, uh, is concerned what has happened. He, he feels that it's a threat to them what's taking place. And the brothers say, this was our honor. This is a question of honor. How can we allow such things to take place? And you know, this idea of honor that we hear even today in, in some cultures of, about uh, honor killings, it, you can see the same thing right here in this story. So they travel on to Bethel. They go to the place where Jacob had, had the vision of God. God reinforces the idea that Jacob's name from now on is going to be Yisrael, even though the Torah goes back and forth in both names. Uh, and then Rachel has a difficult time bearing her child, Benjamin, Benjamin, uh, and she apparently die, and she dies uh, in childbirth. And uh, Jacob uh, buries her and uh, buries in her a place that is today known as Kever Rachel, the, uh, the grave of Rachel outside of the city of Bethlehem, Beit Lechem. And then since uh, we are going to be finishing off the story of Esau, as far as he figures into our story, the Torah goes through the line of Esau, gives a, a whole to do about who, what children he had, where they settled, and all those kinds of things, uh, and then write him out of the story so he's no longer on our list of characters that we are dealing with. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a very action packed uh, Shabbat Torah portion. It uh, could and has been made into movies, uh, and uh, there is a fame a relative flame, famous book a few years ago written called The Red Tent that has a particular take on this story. I'm not sure I agree with that take, but uh, if you're interested, it's a very it's an interesting book. Uh, dealing with this story, uh, as well as many other attempts to explain. Okay. So we go to Shul, the Shabbos. That's what you can expect. And I just want to, uh, let's see. All right, it's about time to uh, share the screen. We're going to look at our Hebrew. I apologize not sending it out earlier. Okay, doke. So, this is 22, right? No, it's 25. I need 22. Okay, the letter pay. All right. The letter P is just like the P in English, but it is one of those letters that has two different sounds depending upon whether or not there is a dot in it. When there's a dot in it, it is a P sound. It's an air stop again. If there is no dot in it, there is no air stop. And so it's more like an F. You know, put your, when you put your lips together, when you say F, you blow through your, your lips, right? F, F. But if you put stop the air from flowing, it becomes P, not F, but P. Right? And we will get to later. At the beginning of a word, unless it's preceded by a vowel sound, it always will be a P sound. That's why we have transliterations from English to Hebrew, like physical. You can't really write physical in Hebrew because the letter fe has to have a dot in it at the beginning of the word, but they, modern Israelis play around with it in some way to deal with it, okay? So we're working on the letter pe, and the letter pe is because we're coming up to the word pri. Remember, we've been learning the bracha, the blessing over wine, Borei pri hagafen, and so uh, the next to last word in that bracha and that blessing begins with the letter pe for pre for fruit. Okay, so everybody unmute yourselves. Okay. 
see the people who haven't unmuted themselves. I, 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 they don't want me to hear them. No, they don't. All right, Trumpenix, unmute. Unmute. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens. Okay, so first line, we have pa. 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 Ho. Hey. 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 Ho. Ho. You know, just like just a minimum sound to be able to say the. Okay, line number two, we have pen, 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 pot, 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 par, 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 pain, pain, pain. Yeah, that shouldn't be too painful to say. Okay, line number three, paru, paru, ma pa, ma pa. Umapa, 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 because of that rule of the, of the letter pay. Okay, so paro, after paro we have pa'am, 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 Did we do the iron? Did we do the iron? This no, letter? that's in this week. No, not yet. So why are they sticking in there at this point? Excellent. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Maybe I made a mistake. Um, uh, I, yeah, that's 20. That's, oh, I'm, I'm ahead. So that's yeah. my, oh, I think. Okay. Well, we'll finish this page and we'll go back to page 20. I'll have to put that up. I didn't, you, you got that last week, I think. Didn't you? Page 20? Oh, you sent it this week. I sent it this yeah. week? Okay. At least I sent it out. All right. We'll come back to yeah, that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you sent it. This okay. Uh, that, you know what? Let me. I don't you sent 20, 21, 22, and 23. Yeah. And you have uh, All right. 24 and 25 open. So I think you. Yeah. Okay. So forward. let's, let's yeah. stop the share for a moment. I need, I don't want you. Let me get my. Aye, aye, aye. Why can't I find that? Hebrew. So what, what are, you've got, all uh, right, so we need 21. Uh, 20 and 21, okay. All righty. My apologies, everybody. The letter I in which we have already met a minute ago, but we're going to actually look at it now. We're going to treat it just like we treat the letter Aleph, as if it has no sound. But actually, 
the letter ayin, originally at least, was a, sounded very deep in your throat. It, it, I don't know the proper term for what the sound it is, but it's not ayin, uh, ah, ah, is ah, ah. Gaza, the Gaza Strip, in Hebrew is Aza. Aza, Aza. Now, most Israelis do not pronounce the ayin. Uh, those who come from Arabic lands do uh, and, and retain that pronunciation. But for us, in most part, we're just going to ignore the fact that it theoretically has a pronunciation and we're going to treat it just like the Aleph as silent. So the only sound that it will have is the value, vowel that is associated with it. Got that? Is that clear to everybody? Okay, so let's start with line number one. We have a or or Be, um, 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 line three. Allah, 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 or or Allah, Allah. Allah. How do you say that one? Net Allah. Net Allah. See. Theoretically, then it's ne, and then there would be a sound associated with the iron, but you can't make that sound, the shva, uh, shva na. So the the e eh is added to it, so we can make a sound for it. Ne, e, eh, lam. Okay, line number four. Aram, Aram, Mayor, Mayor, Roe, Ulam, Ulam, Enut, Enut, Enut. Line five. Elul, Elul, Achbar, More, More, Mora, Mora, Alu, Alu. Now, by the way, we're having real words here. Elul is the month of Elul, the month before Tishrei, the month of Moshe falls. Achbar is a mouse. Mora <laughs> is a male teacher. Mora is a female teacher. Alu, they went up. Okay. Line number six. Na, Na ma, ma, ma. Anan, no am, leman, leman, Can you repeat that one? Lema, this is the last one or all of them? The last one. Le ma ancha. Le ma ancha. Le ma. For your sake. Now the word ha'olam means the world or eternity. All right? They say here the world or universe. So we say a bracha, we say the blessing, uh, which now you can read the, the beginning of the blessing. So let's read it together. We say Baru Ata Adonai Elohim Mela Olam. So that can either be praise to you, blessed are you, Lord Adonai, our God, Melech, ruler, king, sovereign, Haolam. It could be the king or ruler of the world, of the universe, or eternal. Eternal King. All those are possible ways of understanding. 
Okay. Rabbi, is it Akbar a spider? Or, oh, oh maybe I'm thinking Akbish. Akbish. Akbish is your spider. Oh, it's, Akbar. it's the Akbish climbed up the mine spout. <laughs> Down came the Geshem and washed the Akbish out. Up came the Shemesh and dried up all the Geshem. It's a bit the Akbish climbed out the uh, Geshem spout again. Old <laughs> pump. That's what happens when you got it. Done. All right. So this is kind of a review. Since uh, you guys just work on this on your own at home, we were on 23, right? No, no. We got to 22 was the iron. That's where we had to go back on. Okay. So let's go back to line number five here on uh, this page, which is 22. Okay. So line number five. Po L Pu Al Po Al Amen Parochet Parochet Parochet. That means a, a curtain. The uh, curtain in front of the ark and the Aronach Kodesh, the holy ark is called a parochet. Line number six. Para. 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 Pay wrote. Pay wrote. Barura. Barura. Barera. Barera. Anai. Anai. Okay. Nine seven. Le am. Um. Mapatcha. Mapecha. Mapecha. Ora. Aroha. Aroha. Par parrot. Par parrot. Okay. Um. Can I ask? Uh, sure. Of course. The so the rule you were saying again when you were mentioning I think it was on uh, the uh, third line paro uh, for Pharaoh yeah um, but you said without the dot it would be a more of an F sound right yeah but you you can't have uh, well the, the letters uh, that we're going to be worried about the bet pay and the chaf. Those are all that can have a dot or not have a dot, right? Air stop, not air stop. Right. The beginning of a word normally has to begin with an air stop. Oh, I see. Okay. So what about so, so what about like, uh, but like 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 Banu and stuff like that? Ba is Banu. Oh, oh, I see it in in the Sidur okay. when it's transliterated as Banu. Still. Okay, well, it has like I share Bachar Banu. You chose us, Bachar. That's a bet again. Banu us is, is a dot in it. Mm -hmm. or, uh, or for Ray. Now you have Kivanu for us. There, the, the 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 dot drops because the key precedes it. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, it, I don't want to go too far on that because you have to know a little bit of the grammar and everything to, to really work it out. But normally, you know, if you see the let word with a pay at the beginning of a word, normally it's going to be a P sound. We would like the word vi Vayomer. Well, there's, what's, what about it? Vayomer. There's a Vav. Yeah, but it's the... Oh, it's sorry. It's not a vet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was like... So there are V sounds. So, but with, so with the P though, then that means it would all, every word that would start with with pay would always be the P sound and would never be F. Technically, okay. technically, yes. Right. Like I said, unless there is a vowel sound in the word preceding it, which will sometimes affect a change. Right. Okay. Okay. So if we were to say like the Pharaoh, you would say ha. We'd be ha paro. Ha paro. Oh, okay. That's because, so because of the preceding. We're getting a little far, but I'll just let you know when you put the letter okay. A in front of a noun, the first letter is supposed to have a dot in it. <laughs> okay. 
Right. Okay. okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. All right. Everybody else has no idea where we're going here, but we'll just start. We'll get one more uh, vowel letter sound in here. All right. We're dealing with the sound of the vowel E, chirig, E. Okay. Right here. That's an E. The long form of the vowel is this, is the, yud, the dot under the previous letter, followed by the letter yud, which we e. This is e, and this is e. Because we're working on pari, right? So the end of the word pari is, there's the dot followed by the yud, pari. Okay. Why is there two ways well, for it to be? Okay, normally when it's this way, it's a short vowel. There's a certain uh, grammatical aspect to that. Okay, it's a short vowel. And, and normally that means that the word is going to be connected to the next letter or the next letter. So, for example, im, although it's one one syllable. Uh, I understand. Right? Yeah, there's going to be another letter after it, yeah. as opposed to the other one. There's that's usually the end of it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the end of the syllable normally. Right. When it's long, a syllable consists of a consonant, long vowel, or consonant, short vowel, consonant. So and what about like the on the line four of the chorim? Yeah. Um, because there it's consonant long vowel consonant. Well, that's at the end of the word. Oh, okay. So just the that's the plural form at the end of a word. The masculine plural oh. is im yud mem at the end of a word. Oh, okay. okay. But all right, but here, here's an example line number two. No, it's not a really good example because there's no dot in the mem, but the line number two, im me, but it really is im me, im me. But they don't put a dot in there. They really should, but that's a different story. Okay? We've got everybody confused, so let's just go on and ignore, <laughs> ignore that part. All right? The ori, the next one, right? Like yeah. All right. So let's go to number, line number one. We have lee, lee, lee. P, R, M, B, C, E. Line number two. Im, E, U, My light, A, L, My God, L, B, My heart. Line number three. Bye. 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 Eat. Bye. Eat. Bye. Bye. That means I, a house. Bait. Bait means house of. I. 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 So the third one there is it's by. Uh, as by eat. Or is it? That okay. would be a standalone noun. House, a house. Okay, by you. This bait actually means house of. Right. Bait safer, house of the book or of school. Bait midrash, the house of the midrash. Bait paro, mm -hmm. Pharaoh's palace, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then there's Habayit Halavan, which is the White House. All right. Number four. Line four, we have Eton, Rimon, Rabim, Bechorim, Horim. You have a newspaper, you have a pomegranate. You got lots of things. You got the firstborn or the choice and parents. Horim, some of your parents out there. Okay. 
Line number five. A Lim. O La by the way, you have to be careful. The Ramon, while it's a pomegranate, can also be a grenade. So be sure which one you're getting. You get yeah, same word. Really? Well, just like there's a slang for a pineapple for a hand grenade. All right. Line number six. My. And limon. Limon. Versus limon, which is a pomegranate. Limon is a lemon. Line number seven. Le umi. O lim. Or Purim. All right, now I say the word pre means fruit. Uh, it can also mean fruit of. But I just want to show you and uh, how things work. All right, aisle is a ram. The plural of aisle is a lim. So the vowels, sure, you still got the, the three root letters, Aleph, Yud, Lamed, are there. The Yud Mem at the end is the plural form, but it has to, the sound, the voweling changes a little bit. Uh, don't have any. Okay. All right, well, we're going to stop here for tonight. Okay, 20, at 23. And I'm going to try an experiment tonight with a couple of videos, if I can get them up right. Uh, it's not on once. Let's close that. Close all tabs. Video. Let's see if this is going to work. It's an experiment. Share screen. Okay. This is a video on how filling are made. Oh, wow. Okay. Everybody hears it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not it's just music now. I'll be right back.
Okay, so that's how to fill in our maid. It gives you an idea. Uh, the Torah says in the, the first paragraph of the Shema uh, that we are commanded to put them on our, 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 our tamals of the uh, We're going to have to quote something like this. I always start getting confused. You should love Lord your God with all your heart and all your might, right? And then it says in the Quran translations, if I can see it here. I'm having some real eye issues these days. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart. Teach them repeatedly to your children. Speaking of them when you sit at home and when you travel on the way, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be an emblem between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your house and gates. Okay, so that's repeated in the whole, the mitzvah itself is four places in the Torah that it talks about uh, the tefillin, uh, of, or at least the writing on your hands and, and uh, between your eyes, okay? Now, very early in ancient Israel, this was interpreted to mean uh, exactly what we were just shown in that video. That tefillin were boxes, leather boxes that contain scrolls and that were supposed to be worn. Uh, we know that uh, they have found uh, tefillin from more than 2,000 years ago in, in, in archaeological excavations. And they are, very, are similar to the ones that we have today. Uh, and we also know that it was a practice, of, uh, at least by some in the uh, Jewish community of, of ancient Israel, or the rabbinic period, to wear tefillin all day long. Uh, and uh, only taking them off when you would go to sleep or you would go to a place where it would be considered to be inappropriate for tefillin to be found or Torah scrolls and things like that to be there. Uh, at some stage of history, that was no longer the normative practice. There always were some people, some men who might do it all day long or in this, when they were studying in, the, in, this, in this study house, uh, Nidrash. but it became the accepted practice that they were worn during the morning service weekday mornings, not on holidays and not on Shabbat. Now, along with that was the understanding that they had to be bought, they were worn during the day and not at night. And that is the basis for the rabbinic understanding that women are not obligated to wear tefillin. We are going, a number of mitzvot are called in Hebrew mitzvot shazman grama. These are mitzvot that have to be performed at a certain time, that are time bound commandments. And there are exceptions to that rule and whether or not the rule is, it, uh, the rule came first and the, and the interpretations later or the, the, the interpretations came first and the rule was created to try and fit all of those things. I, I, I don't know. But traditionally, 
if a mitzvah had to be performed at a certain time of day, men were obligated, women were not obligated. Now, there's a debate in the Talmud that if someone is not obligated, can they still perform the mitzvah? And in general, Ashkenazic tradition was they can. So uh, I'll give an easy one. Uh, the waving of the lulav and etrog on Sukkot has to be done during the day on the holiday of Sukkot. So it was understood to be incumbent upon men, but not on women to do it. However, in many Jewish communities, and I'm not talking about liberal left-wing reform or whatever, from women, bench lulav and etrog. They weigh the lulav and etrog. A major distinction between the Sephardic and Ashkenazic tradition is that the Ashkenazic rabbi said if the woman is going to perform the mitzvah, she has to recite the bracha just like the man does. The Sephardic tradition was, no, that if she performs the mitzvah, she can do so, but she may not say the bracha because you say in the bracha, Sher Kiddushanu Mitzvotav, who sanctifies by his commandments, Vitzivanu, and commanded us to do X, Y, and Z. Right? Now, there was a, uh, indications in the Talmud that there were women who did wear tefillin. There's a midrash that says King Saul's a daughter, uh, King David's wife. And now that I said that, her, her name is eluding me for the moment. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it'll come, I'll remember as soon as I don't need to remember it. Um, but anyway, that she wore tefillin. There's a, a, a tradition that says Rashi's daughters. Rashi, the great commentator, did not have any sons. He only had daughters. And it said that his sons wore tefillin, uh, his daughters wore tefillin. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch, when the question was raised, there were two ones were about wearing tzitzit, and the others wearing about the tefillin. I'll explain more about the tzitzit in a minute. But the answer that the Ramah, Rabbi Moses Easterlis, who gives the Ashkenazic tradition, uh, says that if a woman wants to wear tzitzit, she can do so, but he considers it to be kind of a haughtiness because she's not commanded to do so. But she may not wear tefillin uh, because tefillin require uh, that the body always be kept in a state of cleansly, cleansing, cleanse, cleanness. Uh, and one is not even supposed to pass gas when wearing the tefillin. Or as it's usually pronounced, the tefillin. There's your Ashkenazi, Sephardi, different pronunciation. All right. But now, uh, but we do know that that was sometimes ignored by some women over the course of the centuries. And in the modern era, in the last 30 years or so, with the uh, change in, in approaches uh, in, within different movements in Judaism for the role of women. There have been women who started wearing tefillin. Uh, and indeed, in some conservative synagogues, they insist that a bat mitzvah girl puts on tefillin on a weekday. But you do not wear tefillin on Shabbat. You do not wear tefillin on Yom Tov. Uh, and the intermediate days of the holiday, there are different customs. Some wear to fill and some do not. Right. Now I'm going to show you two videos about putting on the fill in. Both of them I have problems with, but I want you to see them and I'll explain why there are problems with it momentarily. All right. Okay, that didn't work. Let's see. That there we go. Good morning. 
put on some tuning and turn these prayer boxes and put on our arm and our forehead. Normally, we do not talk during the process, but today I'm going to talk so we can learn how to do it. First thing we put on is the tali. We hold it in front of us, say the blessing. The kiss two sides of the skull decorative part, the atara, and wrap it around us. If you have a big gully, you probably need to lift the sides up over your shoulders. And the next part we put on is the feeling box for the arm, the body shell yard. And we undo the strap. And this is the one that has the very long strap. Put it so that the loop of the strap goes through your, your arm goes through the loop of the strap. And the strap is up. The other strap is up. If the strap is on the downside, gravity is working against you and it'll keep falling down. Most times you'll have plenty of extra strap. You may only do one or two times here above the elbow. And then from the elbow to the wrist, we do it seven times. Try to keep it as tight as you can without turning your fingers purple. And it should be about an inch apart. And we say the blessing for putting it on our arm. Which literally is blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, makes us holy to commandment and commands us to tie it on. The time to feed. I, I'm going to make a correction to our video. He should have said the blessing before he put it on to start with. It's not after you've wrapped it around your hand. When you go to put it on your arm, and we'll see that in another video, you say the bracha, the blessing, then, and then continue with the wrapping. Then we put the body show ropes, the head box. On and we put it to right in front of your forehead in the middle with the strap, try to keep the strap with the black part showing, and the side straps coming down across your chest. Um, if, if the head does not fit properly, then bring it to the camper or the rabbi, and we may need to retie it. You're not going to be able to untie the knot yourself easily to, to redo it. Now, there are booklets that tell you how to tie and untie them, and his tefillin are in bad shape. <laughs> they need to be blackened. And you can see that uh, it's kind of uh, worn off. And we say the second blessing. Baruch Asher Al Mitzvah, believe, was you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has made us holy with your commandments, commands us on the mitzvah of believe. Now comes the hardest for most people, and that's what to do with the table. So, first, we have one strap across the middle part of your palm, the back of your palm. Then we're going to take the strap and do it three times on the middle finger, and we say the first of three sentences. The Aras Tifli Le Olam. I will betroth you. I will marry you for me forever. Then we take it and do it over these two middle fingers, and you say the second sentence. Then you go from the fourth finger to make like a V on the back of your palm, and then 
to make on the letter she, the Aram, she, the Emunah, the Adaha, and Adonai. And any of put over, you put over that middle part of the she and thicken. And a little bit at the end. We have the letter she, the letter Dalai, the letter you. Which is one of God's names, which is Shaddai. To remove the Tefillin, we do everything in the reverse order. We take off the hand part and just leave it loosely in your hand. Then we take off the one from the head, and then you take off the rest of the strap from the arm. It's pretty hard to learn, but when you do it, a whole bunch of times you get very used to it. And if you are left handed, you do it on your right arm and the knot needs to be switched, switched over on the top of the, uh, the arm part. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask the Rabbi of Jancher, and we wish you good luck learning to put on the field. All right, just a moment, I'm gonna show you another video. Uh, there are different customs, and it's, it's hard to say if there's something is right or wrong. Uh, but the way I learned it was that you, when you say the the verses, you do that on each time you wrap it around your finger, not the extra wraps that come later on. And all the blessings always take place before uh, you perform the action, not after. But uh, in general, that was the style is of the Ashken, normal, normative Ashkenazic uh, presentation of the tefillin. I'm going to give you a different version right now. I hope. Did it come up? Hey everybody, so we're going to do a little lesson this morning on how to put on tefillin. So this is a lesson about my worldwide bar bar mitzvah tefillin right here, part of the worldwide bar bar mitzvah program. And uh, of course, anyone that's familiar with the worldwide bar bar mitzvah program knows that if you're in the program, we offer the 40 day tefillin challenge, put on tefillin for 40 days straight, earn your free pair of tefillin. You always want to put your tefillin on your weaker hand. So if you're a righty and you're right with your right hand, you want to put it on the left hand. If you're a lefty and you're right with your left hand, put it on your right hand. And then make sure for lefty and fill it for righty. So make sure you get the right one. And here we go. So I'm picking at the shell yad, the shell yad, the one that goes on your yad, also known as your hand. And open up the box right here. If you can see this. It's a really neat little case with a cool little mirror. Now, the uh, film shell yad has a cover on it. You can leave that cover on. Okay, and you have a loop. You'll notice on this filling, there's a little knot here. That knot is always going to be on the inside, closer to your heart. Okay, so my hand, just in case you were wondering, should your hand go through this way or should your hand go through this way? You want to put your hand through from the part that where the knot's going to be on the inside. So there you go. You put your hand right through all the way up as high as you possibly can. And the reason I say that is because it's filling, you want them to go right on top of your bicep. Right on top of your bicep. You want to hold it right there. Okay. And I'm going to just, just press it up against my chest so that I don't have to hold it. So that now I can use my other hand and I can tighten it. Just before I tighten them, though, I'm going to make my first blessing, the first breath up. Okay. And um, I'm going to uh, make the blessing for you just so you know how to do it. And then I'm going to do the second blessing. I'm going to do the hype story. So the first blessing goes like this. And I'm actually not going to say God's name because I don't want to. I'm not actually putting on stone. I already did it today. So it goes like this. Baruch Ata Ado Mai Elokeinu Melech Olam Asher Kedushanu Mitzvah Betzivanu Lehania Tefillin. That's the first bracha. You can find it in the Sidur. After you make the bracha, of course, we don't talk, but I'm talking just so I can show you how to do this. You then tighten it nice and tight. Now I can let go. It doesn't have to be pressed against my chest anymore because I just tightened it. After you tighten it, you're not going to wrap it seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now you have your seven wrappings. Now what you do now is you just put the rest of it around your hand, just like this, because you want to just, you're going to come back to the rest of the hand filling. But for now, you just wrap it all right around the hand, right around the palm. 
And you can tuck it in for now, right here, just like this, just so you can just use your fingers for the other part. Of this. Now remember, we I just want to point out what he is doing, you know, there are traditions that are Ashkenazic traditions, Jews from Europe. Uh, and then there are uh, traditions of the Sephardim, uh, who are uh, descendants from Jews who lived in Spain and then went to North, in North Africa, and the Eidot Mizrach, uh, Jewish communities throughout the Middle East. There is also in the Ashkenazic world what we call Nusach Ashkenaz and Nusach Sfard. Not, right? Nusach Sfard is, it comes through uh, the Hasidic movement and uh, it has some impact in certain ways. Uh, and one of them is the way he's putting on the tefillin is Nusach Sfard. I, you, may not, you may not notice it, but when the cantor, the chazan in the previous uh, video put on his tefillin, he wrapped it going this direction. His tefillin are being wrapped going outward. Right? So that is a difference between Ashkenazim and uh, Nus Nusach Ashkenaz and Nusach Sfard. You really do want tefillin. After you make that first bracha, you don't talk until you do the second bracha, okay? Now, we got my worldwide bar rental program. And take out my second one. This here is the shell Rosh, Rosh being a head. And you just kind of let all the parts of the fill and fall there, and you hold it nice and tight. And here, if you'll notice, there's one big circle right in the middle, and then you got the two parts that come down on the sides. The two parts that come down on the sides are going to go down to your two, right, just over your two shoulders. So you say, yeah, you take this, you hold it, you hold it in front of you, okay? Um, and this knot here, you're going to see, is going to go behind your head. So you want to lift it up. Put your head right there, okay? And now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take off my two parts just for a second, because remember I said there's nothing that separates between the fillin and our skin or the fillin and our, and our body. So now the fillin is gonna be right between my eyes, okay? And we got the two parts coming down over here. And the knot, if it's fitted correctly, should be right in the back of your head, just below where your skull is. If it's fillin' on your head, you don't want it to go below your hairline, or in my case, where my hairline, where my hairline used to be. Okay, so your your fillin', you want it to be just above your hairline and right between your eyes. Once you have your fillin' in place there, before you actually put them on and tighten them, like I already did that, but what you want to do, you actually generally want to just sort of put it in before you pull it down and tighten it. You want to make a second bracha. And then you can tighten it nice and tight. And we are ready to go. Once you've done the head filling, once you've done the hand filling, the arm filling, now we're going to come back to that again. Okay, and this is the confusing part. They take a little bit of practice. I'm going to unwind this, okay? Not all the way, just just to make it. Now remember, where we last left off, we had done seven windings, okay? So I'm going to come back to that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from under my palm, and I'm going to go straight to my middle finger, okay? And I'm going to wrap three times around my middle finger, one, two, three. After the third one, I'm going to come back up to come from there. So again, have it here, under my palm, one, two, three on the finger, and then on the third one, so the third one, just after I do the three around my middle finger, I'm going to come back up to the top of my hand, and underneath the bottom. Back up to the top of my hand, underneath the bottom, and then wrapping up. Now there are a couple of extra blessings, which we do say as we're wrapping the hand fill in. Um, but the two most important are the two blessings, the two prayers that we make. You can look at any seal to find out exactly the prayers that we say that we got the finger around. But that's it in a nutshell. So I'm going to do an instant replay for you. Okay. So you see that uh, there are different customs in different places on how the tefillin are uh, put on. The uh, most conservative synagogues, they will fo follow the Ashkenazi tradition. There are variations. I don't do it exactly the way either one of them showed it, uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, now, 
as I said, the tefillin are only worn during the week. They are only worn during the day. They're not worn at nighttime, nor are they worn on Shabbat or on holidays. The talit, in the last paragraph, and when we recite the Shema, it says, They should put fringes on their corners of their garments for the generations. Now, the word tzitzit means a fringe, uh, a decorative device, as it were. What the rabbis understood is that when you have a garment that has four corners on it, any square garment, any rectangular garment is supposed to have tzitzit on it. The mitzvah, at least as traditionally understood, is not that you have to put on a talus, but if you have a garment that has at least four corners, then that garment must have tzitzit on it before you can put it on. Now, obviously, most people don't wear four corner garments all the time. And so the custom arose for men. Again, it was originally just men, women. Uh, also, throughout history, we've had examples of it. And today, in, in more liberal circles, women do it as well. Um, put on a, the, a large tali to various sizes, what have you, for the morning service. The person conducting the service in the afternoon and the evening in some customs wears a talit as well. The talit uh, is basically you have four th threads that are doubled over, giving you a total of eight. And there's a series of knots and wrappings that are done on the uh, tzitzit uh, to, to make it into the uh, final stage. Technically, as long as you've got the uh, four strings that are gone through the corners of the garment and they've made a knot and they hang down a little bit from there, you fulfilled the basic mitzvah. Anything beyond that is, is acceptable, different custom. Uh, but the standard custom is you wrap it three, uh, you say a double knot, you wrap it seven times a double knot, uh, eight times a double knot, 11 times a double knot, 13 times a double knot, and you're finished. Now in the Torah itself, it also mentions patil uh, usually translated as a blue thread. One of the four threads is supposed to be techelet. Techelet is related to the dye that was used for purple. And it was a very expensive dye in, in a certain period of history during the Roman period, only the emperor was allowed to wear purple clothing. And at some point in time, the tradition felt by the wayside. And for, for over the centuries, there have been attempts to reestablish a tradition of having one thread dyed blue, to chaylet, but it has to be that particular kind of dye. And in recent years, there's been a very big uh, uh, moving, movement to reintroduce that. And there are many people, I have on my tzitzit, a patil to chaylet. I have blue threads on my talitot. My ver, uh, ver, whatever tall list as I have. Uh, now, while for the most part, the talit is only worn during the prayer services, in order to fulfill the mitzvah, it was a, law, a custom amongst Jews going back centuries to wear at least a garment during the day that requires the presence of tzitzit, fringes on your garments. So that's why you will see many observant Jews will wear a rectangular garment, usually under their clothes, and with the fringes hanging out or, or, or tucked into their pants one way or the other. Chassidim, you will see, and uh, some others as well, wear a wool one on the top of their shirt all the time, maybe under their coat, their jacket, but uh, they will wear it uh, that way and they will have the black stripes coming across it that way, made out of wool. So 
standard uh, practice is that you wear you every time you pray in the morning, you wear a talit. When you pray in the mornings during weekdays, you're supposed to put on tefillin. Now, a large uh, in, in the Ashkenazic world in Eastern Europe, the tradition developed at some point that unmarried men did not normally put on a large talit during the prayer service. They might wear tefillin and their small, what we call a talit katan, uh, but they did not wear a large prayer shawl for davening purposes until they got married. So, um, Okay, I want to, for the moment. All right, so this is a tali, this is one of my older tali totes uh, that doesn't have the blue threads in it. It's, I haven't worn this in years because there's a tear in it. But you see, so you have in each corner, you have where the seat seat go. Most tali totes have some kind of striping, the large ones. Uh, this one has blue in it, others may have uh, black. There are fancy ones today, all colors. I have a gray one that I used to wear somewhat. Uh, in those circles where women wear the talit, many of them prefer to have a more, quote, feminine talit. Uh, and so there are all kinds of talit out there in the world today. Uh, but like I say, so if you go to most Orthodox synagogues, the unmarried males do not wear a talit. That way the girls know who's available. And they, you know, if they want to say, I'm going to make a sh they look over the balcony from the balcony or look over the, oh, he looks like a nice bachar over there, maybe, you know. Uh, but uh, similarly, the, the unmarried women don't cover their hair uh, either. Um, in standard conservative synagogues, those reform synagogues where, where people wear the talit, uh, it usually starts with bar mitzvah, bar or bat mitzvah for the wearing of the talit. Now, one other item of clothing, and that's a head covering. Uh, we know that the, the Talmudic era saw this as a sign of uh, special sanct uh, um, piety. We read that there are certain things that can be done uh, in the synagogue bareheaded. So if you can do something in the synagogue bareheaded, obviously you didn't have to cover your head when you went into the synagogue. By the medieval period, it became certainly diragur that men covered their heads, especially in the synagogue. In the modern era, in the Orthodox and conservative world, at least in the synagogue or when eating or in praying or studying to cover one's head. There is no exact rule on what cons cons constitutes a head covering. You can see very tiny kippot. You can have big kippot. Some people wear them on the top of their head. Some wear them on the back of their head. Those who have hair and they're young, they sometimes wear them on the side of their head, depending on what they're running around doing. Uh, but that uh, is neither here nor there. Again, one of the distinctions between the uh, Haredi community and some of the more right-wing Orthodox is that when they pray, they always have a head cut, either a talit over their head or they wear a hat, the, the, fame, the black hats in, in the synagogue. You can see pictures 
paintings, I think there's one by Rembrandt of the Spanish Portuguese synagogue, which is in uh, Amsterdam. And the men there are praying. They have a tricorner hat on and the talit on top of that hat. Uh, as uh, the, the, the demonstration earlier about how to put the talit on, the talit is supposed to be big enough to cover your, your back in front, pretty much. Uh, uh, it's supposed to be worn the, uh, covering you, not just as a little shawl wrapped around your neck. I hate those things. Uh, now, as far as women in head covering, again, you have a development. The Talmud and the Talmudic era seems to be that women in general, certainly married women in general, did not go out in public with their head uncovered. You look at medieval Europe, you see that women in general had uh, some kind of covering. You know, the, 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 the covering you see of, on, on nuns was, was a, a, a kind of device that was found on many women, not just those who were nuns. Uh, when we got into the modern era, we began to have a movement away from uh, women necessarily covering their head completely. Uh, and so when <clears throat> you look around in today's Jewish world, you find that there are several different practices. You have in the Orthodox community, the ideal of a woman wearing uh, some kind of head device that covers all of her hair once she's married. Hair is said to be a part of a woman's beauty and therefore it's not supposed to be on display to the public. Within certain Hasidic circles that became such a, a, an approach that women shaved their heads when they got married. I don't understand that at all, uh, but they, uh, and so they keep their heads shaved. There began a practice, and this is found even in the Talmud of women wearing a wig covering their hair, which some of the rabbis got very upset with because sometimes the wig looked better than their own hair. If it, and if it's for modesty, how's that modesty? Um, in, uh, uh, in synagogues up until the probably the 50s, late 50s, even in reform synagogues, women, just like women in churches, wore a hat. And some of the very important Orthodox rabbis of that period, their wives wore hats. As hats went out of fashion, women uh, stopped wearing hats to shul if they weren't, uh, didn't cover their hair all the time in some way. Uh, sometimes they would uh, wear a doily, we always call it a doily, just a kind of little chapel veil uh, on their head. That's my, what my mother always did when she went to the synagogue. Um, and now in the last 30 years or so, again, with these changes in, in roles and approaches in, in the role of women, many women have adopted wearing some kind of a yarmulke, a kippah on their head. Uh, sometimes making it into a more feminine device uh, in the synagogue. Uh, the only other thing is when you go to the synagogue, you're supposed to be dressed nicely. You shouldn't come in in rags and dirty clothes and schmutzig looking kind of a thing. Right? Um, so I just wanted to point out uh, These are my personal tefillin. As I showed, this is for the arm. Uh, I have mine tied in a certain way so they don't slip. As I get older, my skin became a little uh, less uh, elastic. And so my tefillin were falling over the place. So I adopted the tradition of, of a, an extra kind of knotting on it. So the idea being just before you knot it, you tie it tight. You get it, hold, you hold it next to your chest and you bring it around. I do it with an extra one on top as well, an extra one on the bottom there. And then the seven times wrapping around. 
not going to turn. Now, both of the videos showed you putting the Tefillin and Shil Rosh on, first wrapping up your hand, and then putting on the Tefillin and Shil Rosh. There is a custom following the Vilna Gaon that you do the hand first before you go to the head. And again, there are variations. The way I do it is once, two, three times around that finger, down and around, and then I have my reish, my shin rather, on the hand there. That, and then I put on the, the head to fill in without the extra bracha. Again, that's a different, that's because of Vilna Gaon. Uh, easiest way, do it like this. Good vision of what I look like here now. By the way, again, things that have changed. When I was growing up, you always saw the guys doing this or this, you know, making sure that the filling was you know, right in the middle and actually probably wore a little lower down than is the accepted practice today. However, as the practice became stricter, they were more, much more concerned to make sure it stayed right in the middle there. So you start having mirrors that are around so the guys can see where the tefillin is on their head. All right. It's not very straight, but that's because I'm not straight. Uh, you always put the talit on first. And when you go to take it off, you take the hand off first, you take the head off. And then after you've put everything, uh, finished taking the hand off, then you take off the talit and you can go on your way. The one, one other thing that we didn't get a chance to talk about, I just want to touch it briefly. Maybe I'm next week, I'll say a little bit more about it. There is also in that paragraph, the passage, it says, uh, al mezuzot You shall inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your gates. And that, that uh, is the mitzvah of having a parchment. It has the first two paragraphs of the Shema written in it. And that scroll is then rolled just like the, uh, the, the video. It showed you how you roll the, the, bless, the, uh, the passages from the end to the beginning. You do that. And then that parchment is put, usually put into a container. And then you put it on the right hand side of the door as you enter into a room. Uh, I will talk about it more next because I see it's already getting a bit late uh, to take note of the fact that it's not only your front door, but it says the door posts of your home. All right, so that means more than one door. And well, we'll get into that uh, next week. Okay. Uh, I had uh, one question. Yes. Um, the So in the uh, course like overview and it tells you all the books and stuff we need to buy, it does say to buy uh, a Talit and, and, and a set of Tifilin. Uh, but I was just curious because like um, when I had spoken both to my rabbi and even some of my, my Jewish friends, they had all spoken specifically of the Talit, uh, you know, of it being like always usually something really, really special, like, buying it getting it the place where your grandfather was born or you know all these like special ornamentary sort of even if it looks the same but just sort of thing yeah. do you just go to israel's and pick up one or do you, or should you exactly try to find one you, or should, you go to israel's or any other place that sells them and you buy one what looks to you it should be big enough uh, you know again it's a different tradition there are those who wear more scarf like talit but even if, if you're going to wear a scarf like Talit, it really shouldn't be much smaller than this kind of a width, at least a, you know, 22 inches, 24 inches. And then when wearing it, one really should wear it like this, covering your shoulders and coming down. Not like you're going out into the winter, you know, to keep you warm. 
that's really not it. Now I will tell you this, when it comes to, you know, that's in the thing about Persian, you really need to talk to your rabbi and especially the ladies and uh, talk to your sponsor about how, what they want you to do in terms of that. Um, a talit can run you a couple hundred dollars, less than a couple, you know, it depends on all kinds of factors. And uh, most of them are made in Israel today anyway. Nobody has, uh, you know, it's from your grandfather's town. My grandfather's town uh, doesn't have any Jews in it anymore uh, since the Second World War. Uh, so there's no real reason to do that. Um, that's real, but Talit is relatively simple. Uh, but talk to your rabbi about their feeling about you wearing a talit now. Nothing wrong with you wearing it at home as practice, but uh, you don't want to mislead anyone into thinking that you're already Jewish. So if you go to the synagogue, you have to be careful to, you know, to balance that out, how you feel about it, or if people know what your situation is in the acting aversion, et cetera, et cetera. Tefillin, well, to fill in, but they're leather. Good quality leather costs more than bad quality leather. Good shoes last a lot longer than poorly made shoes. Poorly made shoes are much cheaper to buy, but wear out faster. Quality to fill in will run you these days at least $750, dollars or more. You can buy them for a couple hundred dollars, two to three hundred dollars are what they sometimes referred to as bar mitzvah filling. Uh, and they won't last a lifetime. Actually, filling not necessarily gonna last. If you schwitz a lot, you perspire, the, the leather goes bad. Sometimes they can be repaired. The leather straps can be replaced. The box is a much more difficult issue if it starts to go bad. Um, and they're, they're, so there are different qualities of tefillin. You can go to Israel's, you can go to the uh, Israel source, see what they've got and, and, and at that point in time, if that's what you want to do. But uh, it's like anything, you know, the more, you know, Generally speaking, the more you're willing to pay, the better the quality of the item. Uh, the cheaper ones are usually cheap. You know, that just depends. Uh, one other thing I didn't talk about, mentioned, they didn't mention either. Usually we don't put the, most people would not put the fill-in straps over a watch. Although again, there's, there's no, no reason that you really can't. I generally take my watch off on occasion. I'm in a rush, I, I don't. But uh, generally, that's what they do. If you are left-handed, the tefillin do go on your right arm. They have to be retied. You can't just simply slide the, the, stri the, the strap in. Uh, it has to be tied a little bit differently. And then you have to have, the, when you get tefillin, you have to then say whether or not you're getting for Ashkenaz, Nusach Sfard, or Nusach Ashkenaz. And if you're right or left. Okay. And if you have a question, you talk to the, the, the bookstore keeper, uh, Jody at uh, Israel Source, uh, uh, Israel Source. But anyway, uh, talk to your rabbi, then give you some guidance there. Some synagogues may have old pairs of tefillin that they've got that are good for enough for you to practice with, to learn to put on tefillin. Uh, once you're comfortable with it, then you start doing it uh, on a regular basis. Okay. Um, else? One other thing I was curious about too is uh, when they were showing how to put on the um, the talit, uh, like the bracha for putting on the talit. I've seen like in synagogue a lot of guys when after they say the first bracha when they put it on they they wrap it around their their head. Yeah. yeah. And say another one and then yeah. No, well, no, it's it's. You put you say the bracha before you put the talit on. That's that's universal. What you do after that is again they're different customs. Um, okay. Um, you know, the first guy showed you. You know you, you look at the the neck piece and you kiss it. You say the bracha baruchat Hashem da 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 kiss it. 
come around and you, you just put it on, he just put it on his shoulders and he wrapped it up to stay on, okay? You will find some who uh, put it on, may even have it uh, still somewhat wrapped up and may cover their head. And then they will they say a verse. It's not really a blessing. They're saying a, a verse uh, 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 from the Torah. Others, and that's a practice that I follow, is very simply. I don't need to look at the neck piece to say the bracha. I have the I have it ready. I say the blessing, and as soon as I've got the finished with the blessing, I put it on. I put it over my head. You don't have to. You can just put it on your shoulders. Uh, immediately after saying the blessing. So different uh, strokes for different folks or whatever you know, it goes. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Anybody else? Anything else? Okay. Uh, How do you wash them? Is there a specific procedure to wash them? Yeah, it's called going to the dry cleaners usually. Oh, really? They're like dry clean only? Okay. <laughs> Well, it depends on the nature of it. However, there's a, a, a joke. It's, it's uh, I'll clean it up. Uh, there's this guy you know, always went to this one uh, dry cleaners who always did his talit for him every year, charged him $25, whatever the charge was, $15. And then that dry cleaner retired and he sold his business to somebody else who was new to the, the thing. And uh, so he comes to the dry cleaners before the holidays. He wants to get his tallest dry clean. And he says to him, can I get my, he says, yeah. Uh, how much is it going to cost? He says, what did it cost you last year? And he says, $15. Okay, I'll charge you $15 to clean your tallit. Comes back a week later, picks up the tallit, and the, the bill is $100. He says, I thought you said it was going to be 15 He says, yeah, it was 15 for the dry cleaning, and it was another 85 to get the knots out of it. Uh, I'll tell you, it's, I'll tell you, this is a joke next week if I remember. Okay. But no, uh, usually with this kind of tally, the big tally told are usually made out of wool. And so you can wash it by hand if you want, or you send it to the dry cleaner. If you wear the, the tally katan, the small tallis that some people do, and then uh, we just, I stick in the washing machine when uh, wrap up the tzitzit so they don't unravel, get tied up with a rubber band and do it hand wash on the washing machine. And it's done that way. Okay. One more quick question. Sure. How come uh, with the feeling you wrap it seven times around the arm, is there a meaning behind that? I'm sure you could come up with one. This number seven though, think about it. We have the seven branches of the menorah. We have the seven days of the week. Now, uh, in the ancient world, there were seven planets that they were aware of. So the number seven is one of those numbers that had, had, was considered to have great power. And you think about it, you have, you have one, and on each side of the one, you have three, giving you your seven, right? For the, the candelabra. Um, so these are all, these, these numbers certainly had powerful uh, meaning to the, in the ancient world through many cultures. Uh, I don't, I'm sure that somebody came up with some sort of answer uh, by seven wraps around the arm. The original mitzvah, I'm sure, was simply to have attached to your arm. Everything beyond that is different customs that developed. Like I said, there's one you wrap it this way. There's one you wrap it that way. There's one where you put the shin on because you're wrapping it one way. The, the, the letter shin, the point is going to be here. The other way, the point is going to be here. And if you know, uh, if you have Sephardic, I uh, see from Eidot Mizracha, Sephardic uh, traditions, they, they put on their hand very differently. Real cool. I like what they do, but I, I, can't, I don't do it. Uh, but it, it's a totally different uh, way of putting on the tefillin. Okay. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? 
Okay, have a good weekend. Enjoy everything as winter is slowly making itself felt here. Watch out for snow.